I wrote my first novel when I was in the sixth grade, and it was fan fiction about Duran Duran. <laughs> and I am going to humiliate myself by telling you that story today. But first, I need to ask you to do something that's a little bit hard. I need to ask you to take a second to pretend that you are a sixth grade girl. <laughs> this will be harder for some of you than others, but don't worry, I'll help you. That's what narrators do. You are awkward, like soul-crushingly awkward. You have bad hair that's too short on top and too mullety in the back. You're a little bit plump, you've got a little bit of acne, you have long, flat feet, like snorkeling flippers. <laughs> and you have braces just everywhere, and crisscrossed rubber bands, and a headgear that you have to snap in at night. And unlike a lot of other kids your age who do not always realize how awkward they are, you know. You get it. And you basically walk around all day just kind of hunched over in apology like, I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> there is no excuse for this. <laughs> Mostly, you're just angry at yourself all the time because you know that pretty much everything about you is wrong. You just don't have any earthly idea how to fix it. So this kid we're all imagining right now is me, circa 1984. You're welcome. Enjoy. It was not my best year. My parents were about to get divorced. My grandmother was about to get really sick. And I was so mean to myself all the time. And pretty much the only thing that was keeping me going that year was my desperate, passionate, obsessive, agonizing love for Duran Duran. <laughs> and I was lucky because I had two best friends who were also awkward and also miserable and also in love with Duran Duran. And we had this genius idea that we should write novels about meeting them and we should cast ourselves as our own main characters. And so we did. We would suffer through the school week, as only sixth grade girls can suffer. And then on the weekends, we would get together and have sleepovers and put on our pages and read our novels to each other in installments. And sixth grade was misery. But those novels were bliss. Here's what happens in mine. Duran Duran is driving through my neighborhood in suburban Houston, Texas in their stretch limo when they get a flat tire. <laughs> and this is the 1980s and there are no cell phones, so they have to find a landline to call a tire guy. And so they walk up to the nearest front door, which just happens to be my front door, and I just happen to be home at the time uh, watching MTV and busting my dance moves to their Hungry Like the Wolf video. <laughs> I hear the bell, open the door, find Simon Le Bon and all his beautiful bandmates standing on my front stoop, freak out internally, but play it cool, <laughs> invite them in, let them use the phone, of course, and then we spent the rest of the afternoon sitting politely in my mother's living room waiting for help to arrive. And somehow, in that short span of time, amazingly, impossibly, like against the laws of physics, all five of them fell in love with me. <laughs> and I had to spend the rest of the novel, you know, deciding who to marry. <laughs> Best novel ever. <laughs> that was the year I got hooked on stories. That was the year I started to realize that stories can save you. 
Because stories are not just entertainment. They're not just something we do in the margins of our lives as a break from reality. Stories help us construct our framework for understanding reality. There's a theory that we evolved on stories, that people who were good at stories were physically more likely to survive, to pass on their story-loving genes. And it makes sense, because our first best teacher is firsthand experience. You know, like if you've been through something, you're like, trust me, I know about this. But our next best teacher is stories, because stories let us learn from other people's experiences as if they were our own. They're like the original virtual reality. And they teach us about the world, but they also teach us about ourselves, and the secret ingredient that they use for doing that is empathy. And y'all know about empathy. It's basically sympathy on steroids. Like, sympathy is like you get it with your head, and empathy is like you feel it in your heart. And stories rely on empathy because stories only matter when we care about the people in them. And writers know this better than anybody because it is literally their job to make stories matter. And I, of course, grew up to be a writer, a novelist of all things. And I've pretty much spent my entire life from sixth grade on studying stories and how they work. And I have figured something out. Stories are basically just empathy machines, like Rube Goldberg empathy machines. That's why we love them. Studies on the brain have shown that when we <laughs> empathize, the pleasure centers in the brain light up. Like when you feel a deep human connection with someone, it prompts the release of all kinds of feel-good chemicals like serotonin and oxytocin, even empathizing with people over hard things like suffering and grief does this. The pleasure of the connection outweighs everything else. That's how people can walk up to you in the grocery store and go, you have got to read this novel, you will cry your face off. <laughs> like, that's a good thing. <laughs> there is no better way to practice empathy than to read a novel. When you step into the shoes of a main character, the writer of that story is basically walking you step by step through a detailed practice of empathy. Those main characters, those point of view characters, are basically like your avatar for the story. You hear what they hear and you see what they see. You know, if it's done right, you basically merge with that character. Even though you're just sitting there on the sofa, you become them in some essential way. And when they're sad, so are you. And when they're frightened, so are you. And when they fall in love, so do you. Done right, it is profound. Done right, it lets you step outside yourself and take a turn as someone else. But it's not easy. Imagining what it's like to be another human being so completely that you actually feel their feelings is a heck of a thing. It's like this astonishing feat of the human imagination that lets us cross the boundaries between ourselves and other people. And it takes a lifetime of practice, but it's worth it because that connection is at the core of human experience. This is not trivial stuff. Stories matter. And that's why I have to call your attention to a little problem that we have in the way that we do stories in our culture that I keep running over into over and over. We tell a lot more stories about boys than we do about girls. <laughs> the statistics bear this out, you know. The vast majority of stories that we admire and talk about and give prizes to and throw money at and make movies out of are by guys about guys doing guy stuff. Only about a third of the novels that are written every year are by women, and women are more likely to write male main characters than the other way around. And so just mathematically, it's not good for heroines. Take picture books, for example. 
30% of main characters in picture books are girls. Although, if the main characters are non-human, like a bug or a dog, which is super common in kids' books, that number actually goes down to 7%. One study on middle grade fiction found that it's 48% male main characters, 36% female, and 16% one of each. Although my son, who's a big reader and he's 12, has told me that often when it's one of each, the sister gets kidnapped pretty early on. <laughs> when I first started noticing this, I felt like it wasn't fair to girls. But the more I think about it, the more I have decided that it is really not fair to boys either. There's an idea out there, and it is everywhere, that girls will read stories about boys, but boys won't read stories about girls. The idea is, if you write a female main character in your kid's novel, you're automatically limiting your potential audience by half. Like if Harry Potter had been Harriet Potter, nobody would have read that book. But I am here to state for the record that I just don't think that's true. Or if it is, it's not because of the kids. I'm a mom and I've been a creative writing teacher for little kids and I volunteered in the library and I'm just generally like a huge enthusiast for books and reading and I have recommended tons of stories to boys and girls and I have never once had a kid say to me, what is the gender of the protagonist? <laughs> little kids don't care. There is a sweet spot, at least your grammar school, where all they want is a good story. I think it's us. I think it's the grown-ups. I think we put our limitations on them. Because if we look at a third grade boy and decide he can't possibly be interested in a story about a girl, how does that not become a self-fulfilling prophecy? If we never give him a chance to practice, how does he ever get good? And then... Worst case scenario, he grows up and gets on Twitter to protest the female Ghostbusters. <laughs> of course, that's not the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is a lifetime of loneliness and isolation. The worst case scenario is depression and anger. The worst case scenario is boys who grow up so unable to empathize with the women in their lives that they get angry if you even ask them to try. Girls, imagine what it's like to be guys all the time. We are constantly putting ourselves in the shoes of male main characters from the hungry caterpillar to <laughs> Captain Underpants, to Holden Caulfield, to Yasarian, to Humbert Humbert, and on and on. We root for them, and we relate to them, and we cheer them on, and we feel for them, and we yearn for them to get what they want, even if it's the girl. It doesn't threaten our identities to do this. It just makes us better at stepping outside of ourselves. It doesn't change who we are. It just makes us better at understanding who other people are. We have, <laughs> we have got to give boys that same opportunity to practice stepping outside their own skin. Otherwise, they run the risk of getting trapped in it. Stories have always been a way out for all of us, and it's so crucial that we understand how important they are for teaching us how to be good at being human. So, the next time your nephew has a birthday, <laughs> maybe don't get him a book about a boy on the baseball team who's exactly like him, or do get him that book if you want to, but also, get him a book about a town that is burned to the ground by a vengeful dragon, and one kid survives, and that kid has to go on an epic quest to find that dragon and seek revenge. That's an awesome story. <laughs> Sell him on the story, and then just make sure that the kid on that quest is a girl. That way, when he reads it, he gets a twofer, right? A great story and 
some full immersion empathy practice. There is a reason I walked in here today talking about my Duran Duran story from 30 years ago. And it is not just because everything in my life seems somehow to relate back to Duran Duran. <laughs> it is the worst novel ever written. <laughs> like if they gave a prize for worst novel ever, I would have it. My sister has explicit instructions to burn it if I am ever hit by a bus. But... It is proof that stories can save you. Back then, when I wrote it, the last shoes I wanted to stand in were my own. I was my own female Ghostbusters. If I could have protested myself on Twitter, I would have. <laughs> but I wasn't just the writer of that story. I was also the reader. And when I read it, I found a main character that I could root for and relate to and empathize with. I didn't even like that girl. But I read her story, and it changed the framework of my thinking. And if I could learn to do that for her, boys can learn to do it for girls. Truly, if I could do it for her, anyone can do it for anyone. Thank you.